So there is no aspect of gastritis that's really a good time. So if you've been researching this problem and getting a little frustrated with the lack of answers that you're finding, in this video I'm going to give you a different viewpoint and maybe point you in the direction of some avenues where you might be able to create some improvement for yourself. Let's get at it. TC Hill is not a doctor and does not claim to be a doctor or licensed in any type of medical field. Don't be an idiot and use anything heard on the show as medical advice. This information should be used for educational purposes only and you should contact your doctor for any medical advice. Now get off me. So when we're talking about something as troubling as gastritis, just remember nothing that I say in this video is diagnostic. I'm not telling you to do any of these things that I'm talking about in this video. You really want to talk to your doctor before you take any of those steps. I'm just a schmuck comic turned nutrition author sharing a viewpoint and some points of view that maybe you haven't looked at this problem from. Maybe that gives you some information that you might be able to dig a little bit deeper and, and find some answers for yourself. So when we're looking at gastritis, when we look up, hey, what's going on with the gastritis issue? We see symptoms like indigestion and vomiting and nausea and stomach discomfort, poor appetite, maybe burning between meals, maybe even at night. And sometimes it could be a little bit helpful to view that I, all these issues here, I don't really view as gastritis causing those issues. Sure, it's possible, but I kind of view this as problems that are going on for the same underlying cause that's creating the gastritis. The gastritis itself, I do see where that could create some burning between meals and issues like that. But when we talk about what may be going on, you'll see that eh, maybe the actual underlying problem is creating these symptoms and that big old symptom right there. So when you look up, hey, what's causing my gastritis? Why does that happen? You hear about things like alcohol and aspirin and NSAIDs and man, when you look up NSAIDs, there's always like, hey, why don't you take some NSAIDs so you can have an ulcer and some gastritis? Like it's really, that you really kind of see a lot of correlations between the NSAIDs. So a lot of people are taking these NSAIDs for things like pain and headaches and joint issues and stuff like that. So if that's an issue for you, you may have the ability to go to our channel and just input the problem that you're having for pain and see if you can find some answers to fix the actual underlying causes of those problems. I just thought of something funny to say about NSAIDs, but that would absolutely get kicked me off of YouTube. So you might have to ask me about that if you just run into me at, at the Home Depot or a dog show. I've never been to a dog show. I always thought that would be cool to go to a dog show. So look for me at the dog show and you can ask me about that. I feel like we're off topic. So also cortisol, stress, you know, hey, don't be stressed. You're going to get some gastritis stuff. But you also hear a lot about H. pylori and bile reflux, as in bile reflux gastritis. I'm going to come back to this in a second, but let's look into this problem a little bit further and see what may, go, may be going on. Because the mucus layer is a big part of this situation because that mucus is there to protect the lining of the stomach from the acid that the stomach is creating so that we can digest our food. And that mucus layer is made up of a lot of water. So hydration becomes an important factor when you're talking about do I have a good mucus barrier here? Well, have you heard about this stuff called water? You really want to drink this stuff called water so that you can make this mucus. That's just something we want to knock out real quick and make sure that you're doing as a human because a lot of humans don't really drink a lot of water. The next thing we want to look at is the fact that that mucus is there to protect us from the stomach acid. The problem is a lot of people are not making enough stomach acid. This is called hypochlorhydria. And it's very common for someone not to be making enough stomach acid. And I see a lot of experts out there that feel like maybe gastritis is caused from the lack of stomach acid because they feel like it's the stomach acid that is triggering the body to make that mucus lining. The mucus lining is there to protect the stomach acid, so if there wasn't enough stomach acid, wouldn't it make sense that the body wouldn't really need to make a lot of mucus to protect from something that wasn't really there? So then when there's a small amount of acid, then it's going into it and getting into those linings and creating that inflammation because there's not enough mucus there to protect it. So is this a possibility? Is this what's going on? I, I'm not saying that that's what's going on, but we keep hearing about this, so we have to wonder, well, why do we keep hearing about that? So the thing is that you can't find really any studies, or I couldn't, that show that a lack of stomach acid is creating this lack of mucus. 
Um, but we see a lot of studies that are kind of giving us hints that maybe this has something to do with what's going on. So let's dig into that just a little bit. Because when you look up what causes hypochlorhydria, one of the biggest things you're going to see is atrophic gastritis. And this is basically where those cells that are making that stomach acid and the cells of the lining of the stomach are atrophying. And they're not functioning the way that they should. So we do see that there's a connection between these two types of things. But the biggest thing, you know, when, it, when somebody says what's causing the gastritis, they're going to yell about the NSAIDs, they're going to yell about the alcohol but they always yell about H. pylori bacterial infections. And this is just very common. It's probably one of the most infections in humans. And a lot of people have H. pylori and it doesn't really create any trouble, so they don't really know about it. It's just very common. But this seems to be a very big player in this inflammation in the stomach. And what's interesting about the H. pylori situation is that when they go into the stomach and kind of take over a little bit, they have the ability to neutralize acids in the stomach so to make the environment better for them to thrive in. So once they get in, then they really can alkalize the stomach and now the stomach is not acidifying the food correctly, so you can't break that food down and get the nutrients out of that food. But I'll put some links to some studies below that kind of indicate that when there's a lack of stomach acid or we see this hypochlorhydria issue, that it opens the door so that infections can come in a lot easier. And that's because this acid in the stomach doesn't just help us break down our food, it's the barrier to the whole body. So when varmints come in on the food that we're eating, they die in an acid bath. Well, there's a lot of people taking medications that turn off stomach acid. There's other reasons that stomach acid will not be produced correctly. Um, a person needs minerals to be able to make hydrochloric acid. It needs that chloride ion, it needs a lot of other minerals to be able to make that hydrochloric acid. So if someone becomes deficient for one reason or another, they may not have enough resources to make that hydrochloric acid. So it kind of makes us wonder, well, when we see that hypochlorhydria is caused by this atrophic uh, gastritis, is that the case or maybe could it have been the other way around? Is the gastritis restricting the ability for the body to make the hydrochloric acid? These are just thoughts and ideas. But what does seem very common is for people to have the belief that when there isn't enough stomach acid there, the door is open for H. pylori or other bacteria or infections to come in and set up camp. Or if H. pylori gets in there and sets up camp, it does have the ability to reduce the ability to acidify that stomach correctly. And you also hear about this acute gastritis with hypochlorhydria, AGH. So we know there's a correlation between low stomach acid and some types of gastritis, or is it maybe just because there wasn't enough stomach acid and the door was open? We don't really know. But this kind of brings us also into this whole bile reflux gastritis type issues. And when we make enough stomach acid so that we can acidify that food, then there's a valve here that's triggered called the lower esophageal sphincter that closes so that food doesn't reflux back up. And that is triggered by stomach acid. There's also a valve at the bottom that closes off so that food can be acidified in the stomach so that we can break it down and get the nutrients out of that food. But the problem is when there's not enough stomach acid, not only does this valve not work correctly and maybe we get some reflux and now acid's coming back up, but this valve may not work as well. So if everything's working correctly, once the food is acidified, it'll leave the stomach and go into the duodenum, and that's when the gallbladder will squirt this alkaline bile down into this duodenum, and then that alkaline bile neutralizes those acids, and the acid meeting the alkaline bile creates this sizzle that helps us bust the food apart and get all the minerals and all the nutrients out of that food. But if this food is not acidified correctly, then this valve may not close and things may not move at the right pace and in the right direction. And then we could see where this alkaline bile could go right up in the wrong direction since this is not closed while things are being acidified. So a lot of people believe that that may be a reason that bile could be refluxing back up into the stomach. It's not refluxing back up there because someone has too much stomach acid and the bile is going there to neutralize it. That that wouldn't make sense in my head. I know some people believe that. Maybe that's true. It just doesn't make sense in the brain that I'm carrying around. But if there wasn't enough acid there to trigger this valve to close, then that seems real easy for bile to reflux back up in there. And if bile is alkaline, 
Alkaline has the ability to irritate tissue linings just like acidic properties do. So if alkaline bile is going up into the stomach that's supposed to be more acidic, that could irritate those linings, but it could also reduce the ability to acidify the stomach properly, opening the door for all these bad guys like these H. pylori to come in and set up camp and have a keg party and raise their kids and create all kinds of havoc. I'll put some links in the description below as well for some studies that show some correlations between people having gallstones and this gastritis or bile reflux type issues. And we know with gallstones that bile is not flowing the way that it should because it's staying in the gallbladder and concentrating until it concentrates into those stones. And sometimes the bile is not flowing like it should because it's not being called on by the acid leaving the stomach. So if there's not enough acid leaving this stomach, it doesn't trigger this bile to bring it on down and then it continues to concentrate into these stones. So when we're seeing studies show those correlations, if we look at it from that point of view, that almost makes sense, where if this isn't flowing the way that it should, and some of this bile is flowing up in the wrong direction because there's not enough acid in there to trigger this to close, and there's not enough acid to move things in the right direction, then it could see where you could really create some trouble like that. So if you feel like you might be dealing with some of those issues, my book, Kick Your Fat in the Nuts, chapters three and four, kind of walk you through looking at both of those aspects of digestion and figuring out if some of those may be going wrong. And the book is available on Amazon, but I'll put a link in the description below so you can get the whole thing totally for free. And then you can just jump to chapters three and four to figure out are there aspects of digestion that may not be working correctly for you and steps you can take to correct those. It's really hard to tell you in a video what you should do because I don't know what's going on with your unique situation. There is no remedy for gastritis because you can see there's a variety of issues that can create the problem. It's really about figuring out what's going on with your body and learning to work with your body instead of just doing what all the cool kids are doing. So when we're looking at correcting this problem, one thing that we might want to consider with everything that we talked about here is do we need to fix the acid function in the stomach? Is it not working correctly? And I hear from people like in the comments of my videos and stuff that they fix their gastritis by increasing their stomach acid, maybe using something like apple cider vinegar, betaine, HCL, and they corrected this problem by improving that stomach acid. It makes us wonder, are these people that talk about gastritis being caused by low stomach acid, are they right? I don't know that they are. I'm not saying that they are. And my viewpoint isn't that if you have pain that you should just start acidifying the stomach because I feel like that's going to magnify that pain situation. But a big problem is you hear about people correcting the inflammation but then the gastritis comes right back in a month or so. Maybe they kill off H. pylori, maybe they allow the lining to heal, and then a few months later they have gastritis again. Well, they didn't close the door. They didn't fix the acid function so that more bacteria can't come in and set up camp and create the same problem. So I think that that's an important part of the formula, and maybe that's also an important part for this mu mucus production, for the body to be able to create that mucus. Maybe there needs to be stomach acid there. I, I don't know, but that makes sense to some people who talk about it. And what's interesting about seeing these correlations between the studies that show poor bile flow and this gastritis issue, and you know, thinking about, well, if bile becomes too thick and sticky to flow correctly, which is really common, then it's not gonna come down and neutralize the acidic food that left the stomach. That alkaline bile is not gonna be there to neutralize it and create that sizzle that really helps us bust the food apart and get all the minerals and nutrients out of that food. That's how we access those minerals. And then the body won't have enough minerals to make that hydrochloric acid. So all of a sudden it becomes important to know, is my bile flowing correctly? So we'll put a link in the description below for our video on 10 signs of poor bile flow. I'm not gonna get into all of that in this video. The video is gonna be an hour and a half but you can check the description to make sure that your bile is flowing correctly so you know that you can really break your food down and get the nutrients and minerals out of that food so that you can make enough hydrochloric acid to keep this problem from coming back again and again. But a lot of people don't close that door so they fix the problem and then it just comes right back. So I think that it's an important part of the formula but I feel like you might need to heal that lining a little bit before you get too aggressive in that area. So one thing that a lot of people will use is cabbage juice. And this is a very popular remedy or tool when people are trying to improve gastritis or even stomach ulcer type issues. And cabbage juice is not magic. That's not how it's working. I don't want you to view it that way. There's components of cabbage juice 
that seemed to be helpful in this scenario. And this is not new information. It was like Hippocrates was doing this kind of stuff. And he was around like a while ago, like before they even had smartphones even. I know, you couldn't even look him up on your smartphone when he was around because it was even before that. Whoa. So this is not new information, but there are components like vitamin U and S-methylmethionine sulfonium. I'll put some links for some studies in the description below that really have dug into these components that show that they can be really valuable in healing these types of gut inflammation issues. So don't view it like magic, it's just that we're seeing a lot of improvement. I'll also put links to studies that show that just using cabbage juice has been able to correct these types of problems for a lot of people and the success is quite high. And it kind of alarms me why we don't talk about this more when you look at these studies. But I talk a lot about celery juice and I use celery juice when I'm really trying to reduce a bacterial overgrowth in the stomach. It seems to be very effective for that. But it seems that cabbage juice may be more effective at doing the healing property stuff. Maybe better at getting the, the stomach back to its original state, so then you could take steps to restore that acid function. But if you've used cabbage juice to improve your gastritis, or maybe your stomach ulcer, or maybe you found some other things that improved it, let us know in the comments so other people can see what's helping other people find answers for themselves. So I kind of view the steps on how to use cabbage juice in a similar way that I use celery juice. And I have a video about how to use celery juice the right way. So if you wanna learn how to do that, jump over right now and check out our video on how to use celery juice the right way so you can use those aspects when you're doing the cabbage juice if you wanna test it out for these things for yourself. Let us know how it goes.